<clears throat> Good evening, Captain Retired Matt Edwards here with the next Observation Post weekly report for the uh, 3rd, I believe, of November 2022. Now, I mentioned last week that I thought I might have some items on my list duplicated. Before I just went on, I found two in what I would have presented tonight. So I'm glad I double-checked a little bit. Anyway... The first point I have is number 152 in my list, and it is the service income support insurance plan rehabilitation is equivalent or equal to the Veterans Affairs Canada rehabilitation due to the program arrangement and the design of the new Veterans Charter. Now, why is that a big deal? Well, you're not supposed to duplicate things in the government because it wastes taxpayers' dollars. And because they have the program arrangement between these two departments, then if you're in one, then basically you should be in the other as well. Now, I meant to look it up, but I didn't do it yet. It'll be easy to do. It's in the Access to Information Act request that somebody sent me. And it talked about the overlap of the program arrangement and who was the boss, basically. Now, I spoke a little bit about that last week, but the thing is, is that it's important because, again, you're not supposed to have any duplication. But if you're in one department, you're supposed to be in the other department. And there was a case in 2003 in the Supreme Court of Canada that is very important. It was called the Martin case, and it was about pain. Uh, that was what the workers' compensation, they had a specific rule there that denied pain. Uh, people who had pain suffer, suffer from pain a lot. So the Supreme Court said denial of a person from an institution is a form of discrimination. So basically what I'm saying in my case, for example, I wasn't made part of Veterans Affairs Canada, which is an institution, and that is discrimination. They ought not to discriminate, especially if you have been in the, Veterans Affairs, uh, the Service Income Support Insurance Plan Rehabilitation, then Veterans Affairs Canada can't very well say that you don't qualify for ours. Now, I found another document, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of it, but it was prior to the new veteran's charter, and it talked about if you get medically released, you will be a dual client of both the Service Income Support Insurance Plan and Veterans Affairs Canada. Now, moving on to number 153, because I was thinking about trying to do a few extra items or I'll never get to the end of this list. Number 153. The former employer, now I say that with air quotes, because the government doesn't employ soldiers. Soldiers serve the country. There's a difference between being employed for a business or an employer where you have to do what they say because, well, you get paid and they get your time. But there's no benefit, for example, for getting killed or disabled. So the thing is, is that soldiers serve a higher purpose. Soldiers, Canadian Forces members, I'm not saying just members of the Canadian Forces, like the Army. It's any military person, they're putting the country ahead of themselves. So therefore, you know, the country should put the disabled veteran, or those who get killed in action, ahead of its interest. However, that was uh, an aside, an ad lib. The government, the former employer has a conflict of interest for things like clawbacks, as they save at the expense of the former employee, and they use a fake insurer to do so. This is one of my key points, okay? Service income support insurance plan, policy 901-102, on paper appears to be manually. But in reality, it is the government of Canada in this particular policy. Because that was who got sued in the Dennis Minouge class action. It wasn't Dennis Minouge versus Manulife. And in the RCMP case, which was uh, a parallel case to the uh, Minouge case, it was called Butte Estate. And that didn't go after Great West Life, who is on paper the same thing as Manulife. So in both cases, it was the government of Canada that was the defendant, and it was the Butte Estate as the plaintiff, and Dennis Minouge as the other plaintiff. And the government lost both cases. 
they shouldn't, well, I shouldn't say they shouldn't have lost, but the answer from the judge shouldn't have been, they didn't know the definition of income. They didn't put it in the policy, which is stupid. Everybody should know what income is. But it should have been, well, you breached Section 30 of the Pension Act. The Pension Act says that you can't touch the pension, either directly or indirectly. Now, the government put that law there for a purpose, to protect the money that's being paid to a veteran disabled service. So the government chose to look the other way and to take it into account and ignore the law they wrote. That's horrible. So, what I'm saying is, is when the government decides, the point of this point is that when the government decides to do a clawback, it's writing a law or putting it into the contract, and we don't have a choice about it, and it's preferring the interest of the government ahead of the interest of the single individual who is adversely affected by the clawback. Now, if they had a valid reason because a government and a democracy is supposed to be governed by reason, then you might be able to do it. But you can't be so cynical as to say what the Dennis Manu's lawyers, McKenna Cooper, a lawyer here in St. John, said to me. When I went to them to get them to represent me, they refused. But one of the things they said, well, you can't do nothing. The government decided to do it. So their the that lawyer's opinion was that if you elect someone they can they are the elected king and they can do what they want but that's not how it's supposed to because in the criminal code they put certain things there to ensure that we would have a responsible government there's things like section 122 which says that if a government actor a public officer they can be charged with breach of trust by a public officer or there's another section, 126, which says nobody can violate a federal statute, like Pension Act, Section 30. So if there's no law that says uh, you can't do it, say, in the Pension Act, if there's no criminal charge or there's no fine or jail time, then in order to enforce any law made by Parliament, the government put a catch-all law in Section 126 that said failure to obey a federal law can result in a indictable offense which up to two to five years in jail or so much in a fine not that i can recall so these are laws they put there to try to ensure accountability for the government so part of that accountability is making sure that they don't steal from people like they're doing in clawbacks what does the pension act and CISIP have in common nothing nothing they aren't the same nature. The Pension Act is a capital payment for a capital loss, and it's meant to indemnify you for your injury. The Service Income Support Insurance Plan is a premium-based, non-indemnity and contributory insurance payable by a formula, and it's supposedly a contract. Now, these are two different things. Now, if you have two different things that are the same, well, well, they wouldn't be different things then, but if you had two things that were the same, they might justify deducting one from the other. But when that comes up, if someone was stupid enough to say it to me, I'd say, okay, let's accept your premise for a second. Who gets to deduct the other one? Is it the Service Income Support Insurance Plan gets to deduct the Pension Act in Manuza's case, or should it be the Pension Act? That reduces itself because of the service income support insurance plan. Now then you have a real big conundrum if this was, you know, a real problem. Because the judge would have to decide who would have priority in every case that came up in a similar manner. But the Pension Act deducts other indemnity payments like mm -hmm. tort lawsuits and workers' compensation under Section 25. Okay, so the Service Income Support Insurance Plan deducts whatever it can under Section 24 and 44. Now, the Canadian Forces member had no say in whoever wrote these laws or policies. And in contract law, there's a very important principle called contra profitorum. 
I might have bastardized the, the, the pronunciation of it. But it's a Latin phrase that says whatever an interpretation in a contract, it can be, mean more than one thing, the preferred meaning and intent will be against whoever used their hands or fingers to type or write the section. So if there's a, I believe they think that because they can say we wrote it, we know what we meant. And that our opinion about what we meant means more than your opinion of what we meant. But it's the exact opposite. If you control the creation of the text that goes into a law or a contract, and then it can be read a couple of ways, you won't get your final say if you're the one who wrote it. In the Interpretation Act is where that states, it says uh, Section 12 says that an interpretate, uh, words in an act shall be interpreted in a broad and generous manner so as the act which will enable the act to attain its object. In other words, you're supposed to have a very loose, like if somebody makes a reasonable suggestion about whatever the word is and it's not obvious, then it has to be accepted because they're supposed to look at what is this act meant to do. Now, the Pension Act is meant to indemnify a Canadian military member for their injury in Canada's military service. Now, the Veterans Wellbeing Act, I'm not sure what that intent is. It seems to be to avoid compensating veterans for their injury in military service. Now, the stated intent put in in 2015 by Harper when they wanted to try to persuade the Equitas lawsuit to give up their claim, they put in that it's compensation for injury. Now, the problem is, is that they don't treat it like compensation for injury. Compensation for injury should be absolutely paid and nobody should be able to touch it. Nobody can take a tort lawsuit from someone who won a case in court. Nobody is supposed to be able to touch workers' comp. Nobody is supposed to be able to touch the Pension Act. Now, when you say touch it, you look at the Manoj case and the government said, well, we didn't touch it. We merely took it into account. Well, that's why they put into the Pension Act that no one can touch the pension in law, that's contract or statute law, or equity, and equity is justice, fairness. Nobody can argue in a court of equity that they have the right to take the pension because when they go to a court to enforce it, the judge ought to say, because of the Statutory Instruments Act, he ought to say, well, the Pension Act Section 30, or Veterans Wellbeing Act Section 89, while well, the government put its mind to this and said that equity didn't apply. So they can't do it if they don't have jurisdiction because the federal government ruled out equity, which is clobber. What is based on? <clears throat> okay. Justice delayed is justice denied. That's an old saying in law. Well, I was thinking compensation delayed, that's compensation denied, okay? Now, I know the Office of the Veterans Ombudsman, I do believe, had a, had a thing, or Veterans Affairs Canada had a thing, and talking about recognition for a person's injury in service. But what do they think? It's like you're going to get a big halo or something? What it's supposed to mean is like if you sue someone who hit you in a car, and you get compensate it for the injury that they cause you. None of this bullshit like recognition. Compensation for injury. Whether it's getting compensated as a civilian worker, you know, workers' compensation, and that's in lieu of the right to sue in tort. Or the Pension Act, which is in lieu of the right to sue in tort under Crown Liabilities and Proceedings Act, Section 9. So the thing is, you have to get compensated for your injury, and your body is a capital asset. Capital is property. So you direct your body to do what you want. If you're a civilian, you can go to work, earn a living. If you're in the military, you can serve and earn a living. But if you get injured, 
your ability to earn a living is impaired. And that's what compensation is. Okay. Number 155. Is government pension policy affected, pro, affecting private pension policy? Now, I think I know the answer a little bit. And then I gave the example, the IBM Supreme Court of Canada case in 2013. Now, the government decided to take things into account, you know, like under the Veterans Wellbeing Act. They take the Canadian Forces Pension into account and reducing the income replacement benefit. They take the Canada Pension Plan Disability into account to reduce the income replacement benefit. Now, the Canadian Forces Superannuation Act pension, that uses bridging, that bullshit called bridging, and they reduce the pension payment because you have two different pensions. Now, the other thing is, is that the government believes that they pay most of the money into a pension, so it matters to the government because of the cost. But what really is the case in the IBM versus Waterman and the Jennings, no, no not Jennings, anyway, 1969 case in England. I can't remember the name right off the top of my head. But they said in that case in 69 that, you know, even though the person got a pension after they became disabled and they didn't contribute to the pension, they said that the person's weekly work was the contribution, the time served with the employer was the payment that entitled the person to get a pension. Now, the IBM versus Waterman case was about uh, unjust dismissal. And they kicked the guy, fired the guy for no good reason. They didn't have cause. And he sued. He won. Now, they wanted to reduce their damages. So, they said, you know, he gets a pension that we paid all of the money to. So, because we paid all of the contributions, we don't think it's fair that he gets the pension and the damages. So, we should be able to reduce the damages for his unjust dismissal by the pension that we paid for. Now, that's very similar to the argument that the government has, that the government says we pay $3.78 for every dollar you puts into the pension. Okay? The thing is, the Supreme Court of Canada said the exact same thing as the 1969 case, and they said that Mr. Waterman, although he didn't pay a cent in financial compensation, his time has value. And any payment made by the company, IBM, was made on his behalf. So, therefore, it was his property that was put into the pension, and pensions are property. You see? So, it came down to they lost the case because, well, they were asking for an overturning of the Bradburn Rule from 1875, which says that insurance and pensions cannot be deducted from damages because they're not indemnity and contributory. So if you get a payment of an indemnity nature, like a lawsuit in tort, or a lawsuit against unjust dismissal, or workers' compensation, or the pension, you can't reduce those payments by insurances like the Service Income Support Insurance Plan because they don't compensate you for anything. They're non-indemnity and contributory, which means you don't get compensated for any injury. You don't get compensated for lost income. You don't get comp compensated for pain and suffering. You get a payment in a contract because you paid a premium. That's it. But you see, that doesn't sit well with the government because they want to save and they want to make it look justified. So they try to say, well, if you got a payment of the income replacement benefit plus a payment from CISIP, well, you'd be getting compensated twice. That's not fair. You can't get compensated twice. Well, they ought to read about the law and understand that the payment from the Service Income Support Insurance Plan is non-indemnity and contributory. Because of its legal nature, that means that Veterans Affairs Canada can't touch it. They can't touch it legally. They are touching it the same way that the Manoge case had the Pension Act being deducted from CISA. You're not supposed to do it, but they did it anyway. Now, the same thing applies for bridging. You have the Canada Pension Plan, mostly the disability, but sometimes on people who are over 65. But it's a non-indemnity and contributory pension, 
which is like insurance, and therefore you can't take it into account to reduce something else. It's You're supposed to get it, no matter what. So you can't have the government reducing a non-indemnity Canadian Forces pension by a non-indemnity Canada Pension Plan. And if they say, why can you do it? They'd say, well, we wrote a law, Section 15.2b of the Canadian Forces Superannuation Act, and we put a law in there that says we can do it. Well, then you ought to ask them. Okay, well, what are pensions? Are they property or income? Well, they happen to be property. And then you'd say, well, under the Constitution, who has the jurisdiction, the provinces or the federal government? Who has the prob uh, jurisdiction about property rights? Well, it's the provinces, not the federal government. Under Section 9213 of the Constitution Act, property and civil rights was given to the provinces exclusively. So then you get back to Section 15.2b of the Canadian Forces Superannuation Act, and you'd say, well, is that law a federal or a provincial law? And the answer would be, well, it's a federal law. Well, now, didn't we just discuss the fact that the federal government doesn't own the jurisdiction to write pension laws? Now, I'm sure that there's some degree of latitude there if they wrote laws that were consistent with normal provincial, and common law pensions, as long as they didn't stray from the general rule. But saying that one property will reduce another property is fucking nuts. If you had two bank accounts, bank account A, bank account B, you're, de you're deducting money from bank account A, and bank account B says, well, we're going to give you less when he takes money out of this bank account. Now, you'd tell them to take a flying fucking leap wouldn't you? Because you have two properties, you paid into both, and you're supposed to get both. But, somehow, they put a law in there and nobody kicked up a stink. But somebody has to, because it's not legal, it's not fair, and it's not equitable. It's against the common law. That's not how pensions work. Pensions are supposed to be governed on trust principles. So, it's not normally the employer that holds the money. It will be a trustee. So, a third party would hold all the money that gets deducted from your check. See? So, that's the way it works. And when it comes down to it, it's called the uh, equitable rights. The person in the pension. The, someone has to own the money legally, and that is normally the employer. But, the equitable, the beneficial ownership is supposed to reside in the employee, former employee because you can't draw a pension and work. So the way it's supposed to be is there's, and it's even put into the Income Tax Act, okay? The government put into the Income Tax Act regulations, section 8500 and something, that the primary purpose of an employer's pension must be to provide money, they might have said income, to a pensioner after retirement. So when the government's getting on saying, oh, this is going to cost the taxpayer too much, so we got to reduce it down and do it, because that's what they're trying to do, reduce the cost for the taxpayer. They're trying to keep themselves looking good so they can get elected. See? It's not the way it's supposed to work. You can't just overturn all the laws and turn everything on its head just because you want to save money. That's insane. If they can do it legally and fairly, i got no problem with it. But you can't expect us to accept bullshit. Now, back to the basics again, number 156. Explain how things work in relation to each other. For example, the service income support insurance plan premiums are paid to obtain peace of mind insurance that pays out when the risk happens. Clawbacks endanger the very reason to buy insurance. Now, I've explained this to so many government officials, including my member of parliament staff. Okay, you buy insurance, you pay the premium, you get some risk covered in the service income support insurance plan. It's the risk of disability that prevents you from working after military service. Now, let's say they don't pay you the insurance that you 
pay the premiums to get the coverage from. They couldn't not. They might say, well, you don't qualify like they did in, me, in my case because they said, you know, Section 41A3 of the policy says that you have to be hurt in service. And how are you going to, you know, how do we know you were hurt in service? Which is what I told them. They were nuts because, well, if I have a visible injury, it will be different than if I have an invisible disability. Now, that's one way they can say it, by refusing to pay. But, you know, if you don't pay out for any reason, another one could be clawbacks. Okay, they might say, well, you know, you qualify, but what's the point of, you know, you getting approved? And they did this to me, too. They said, you told us you're getting a Sun Life policy from where you work for CRA. You told us you're getting $3,300 a month with them. Now, our insurance is based on a deemed amount of, you know, 75% of $2,000, uh, well, 2700 by the time I got approved. So you'd be only getting $2,025 now. If we deduct the amount from the Sun Life payment, 3300 from the 2025, well, you don't get any payment. So why should we approve you? And I said, are you fucking retarded? Are you crazy? I had two insurances covering two different things with the government. One, I was in the military and I had paid insurance to cover my military salary. And I said, I also worked with CRA in the daytime and I paid insurance premiums to the Sun Life thing. And if I got hurt, I get insured for my civilian salary. Now... If Sun Life did the same thing that you're telling me, that because I'm getting a CISIP, then they have to deduct CISIP from my Sun Life payment, and you say you have to deduct the Sun Life payment from the CISIP payment, then I'll get nothing, you fuckers. So, so why did I have two insurances if you're going to try to treat me like that? Now, do you think they listened to that? Nope. I had to work my way up to various managers at Manual Life CISIP until I got up to the Department of National Defense, Minister of National Defense, Peter fucking McKay, and then they came up with a fucking stupid solution, even though it solved my problem in the short term, whoever paid you first, we'll call them first payer, they said. Now, the Sun Life had been approved in 2009, so they were the first payer, and then CISIP started paying me, and I think they thought I was going to tell them, and then Sun Life would deduct the money from my payment. But... I knew that they're not indemnity and contributor, and everything I went through arguing with manual life, I'm not going to fucking do the same thing. So I never mentioned nothing to Sun Life because they're in their fucking business. But when I was having trouble with manual life in 2015 and they were deducting my Canada pension by disability and manual life and Sun Life were both doing it, I ended up talking to Sun Life and I said, listen, told them what I just said to you guys. And I said, listen, would you have tried to deduct the value of my manual life payment from my son life payment. They said no. Now, they had heard all the backstory. Maybe they just told me that because I had just told them what a bullshit uh, event I had happened to me during all this fuss with manual life to begin with. So maybe they're saying that to cover their ass and not have a fuss with me. But in their policy, it states that they will not deduct purely private long-term disability payments. Now, I believe that's supposed to be for non-group insurances. But, I have an answer to that, too. The Ratch Supreme Court of Canada case in 1990 said, why should group insurances operate on any different level than a private insurance policy? If you pay with a group to get a better price, the same insurance principles have to apply, don't they? So that clause about purely private is bullshit. Insurance is insurance. If you have one or two or more policies, people can buy life insurance, and if they want to waste their money, I mean, they will get all the policies after because, I mean, it's not like you, can, you got enough insurance. You paid the money to get it, right? That's the way it works. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Number 157, workers' compensation and the pension had the right to sue and tort exchanged for compensation, but CISIP and IRB do not. Now, I think I covered that sort of before. That's probably one of the uh, repeating myself things that I was talking about. I said, Manoj Federal Court 2012 and the Toth Federal Court 2019, proving that these payments are not akin to damages. So if you take that statement, and 
if you're doing a proof, you know, you go to court about facts that are not proven, they're in dispute. So the government might try to say, well, the income replacement benefit is compensation for injury because we put it into the act. Now, someone questioning them under oath in a courtroom could say, well, you state that in the law, but what do you do with other payments? Like, do you claw back other stuff? You know, like, are you clawing back other indemnities, like the Pension Act? Well, yeah. Well, how come you're doing that? You know, the Pension Act, Section 30, says you can't do it. The Veterans Wellbeing Act Regulation, Section 22A, said you could do it. So you wrote two laws that conflict with each other. Now, after the Manoj case, the government repealed Section uh, 22A of the Veterans Wellbeing Act Regulations, and that caused a fuss because they didn't give the retroactive to the people getting earnings loss benefit and having the Pension Act deducted from it, like they did with the Manoj case and the Service Income Support Insurance Plan was having the Pension Act deducted. So the clawbacks of the CISIP case went back to 1976. But when the government repealed that law in October 2012, they only gave three months for the retro. That's insane. Because the two payments were essentially the same. So they can't argue that it's a compensation for injury because they didn't treat it like compensation. You can't reduce your own damages because the people had lost the court. The government had lost the court case. So in order to save on damages, they limited, mitigated the damages by reducing it to three months instead of 36 years. Okay? That's crazy. Their argument was that it was legal until we repealed it. That's pretty fucking stupid. Okay? That's true for anything. What they're supposed to do is to try to make the victim whole. Now, I know a lot of stats from the earnings loss benefit and income replacement benefit, and there weren't too many people getting it between 2006 and 2012. It's the principle of the thing, okay? You don't give one group in the Department of National Defense Service Income Support Insurance Plan veterans, you don't give them a 36-year benefit in damages, in paying them what they're owed, and then say to the Veterans Affairs Canada, uh, victim, we're only going to give you three months. It's insane. Now, the Toth class action supposedly fixed that, but I think they covered it up. Okay? They called the damages in the Toth case human rights damages. But really, it was supposed to be about the Pension Act being used as a reduction uh, for the earnings loss benefit. Now, I'm kind of finished, wore out from this stuff, but I'll tell you about one more thing that I'm sure I mentioned a dozen times. But, when I was trying to help leading uh, Master Seaman, no, leading Seaman, leading Seaman retired Sean Cream with his uh, double dip clawback and stuff, he gave me some statements to look at, you know, uh, with his permission, obviously. And it was a statement he had from Veterans Affairs Canada from the 30th or the 31st of October, 2000 six and it was about how much earnings loss benefit he would have gotten but they were applying the pension act back from their earnings loss benefit now sham was part of the service income support insurance plan class action the nature of the class action was the pension act was being used to reduce CISIP. so i said sean they can't deduct it at both departments you can't have your service income support insurance plan being saving money for the government by taking the Pension Act into account. Now, that's been resolved in court. But your earnings loss benefit, that was also using the Pension Act. So they were claiming $2 off the pension uh, from two different departments. That's not right. You can't do that. Now, they also grossed up the pension for taxes, it appears. Because his pension was 25 Three thousand or something, but they use forty three hundred or something like that as their clawback amount. But they didn't state it. Now the pension act is not taxed 
And I was going to quote out the income tax act section, but I don't quite recall which part of it it is. I think it's in the 70s. But it's supposed to be uh, tax-free. Well, the word they use is tax-exempt, I believe. Not tax-free. I don't know, I could probably think about what the difference is in the terminology they use, but the thing is, it's not really tax-free because they use the after-tax income of a public servant to determine what a person will get as a 100% pension. So you take a public service after-tax money and then they get a table of disability assessment percentage. Say you get 100%. That you won't get 100% of the gross that the person made. You'll get 100% of the net after taxes, CPP, and the AI and all that stuff is taken out of it. Now, you can't look at me with a straight face and say the Pension Act is tax-free. They use the after-tax amount as the base, the, the, the base, benchmark. Benchmark is the word I'm looking for. So they use the after-tax income of a public servant as the benchmark which is no different than the provincial governments use for workers' compensation. So they both think they're on solid legal ground. But you see, the Jennings 1969 Supreme Court of Canada case, the person who hurt the other person, they said, you know, we ought to be able to take taxes into account because if not, that's not fair. And the judge said, sorry, but taxes aren't part of this case. The government's not here, CRA's not here, to represent the government on the tax matters, for one thing. And if we gave you a deduction for taxes, that would be giving the person who hurt the other person a benefit at the person you did hurt the victim's expense. So that's just not on. That's not fair. You see what I'm saying? So the government, as far as I'm concerned, should pay an additional 30% 20-25% to the people getting a pension. Okay? Because it's supposed to be, damages are supposed to be based on the gross, not the net income. My proof of that is from the Andrews versus Grand Toy 1978 case. The guy made $800 a month. But when they assessed the damages, they used $1,200 a month because they said nobody stays at the same salary forever. So they increased it by 50%. Now, the thing is, everybody believes, because the government is hoodwinking us, and the insurance companies are probably not helping, you should get a percentage of what you were making, say 70, 75, whatever, now 90% for the income replacement benefit. But you know, that's a fair cry from the 150% that the courts awarded in the Andrews versus Grand and Toy case, isn't it? So the thing is, is that they ought to try to be a bit more fair, okay? So that's where things like when they decided to put in the permanent impairment allowance in 2006, so it was a step in the right direction because they were supposed to pay an additional amount based on loss of comp uh, seniority and promotions. Now that was what they increased the amount what for in the Andrews case. That's why they compensated the person by increasing the amount of damages by increasing the salary the person made and somebody might say well that's not factual what why did they do that well they use common sense right but many people have gone before the senate and the house of commons and there's documented records where people say how come a disabled canadian veteran is frozen at 75 percent of what they were making when they became injured. So a brand new private, not making very much, they will be frozen at that for 50, possibly up to 40 or 50 years. They said, that's not fair. And I totally agree with them. So that's why they brought her about the permanent impairment allowance, which became the career impact allowance, which then became, stupidly, the additional pain and suffering compensation. Because it was originally designed, according to the Canada Gazette, to be a, an economic payment for your loss of promotion and seniority. 
but between 2006 and 2016, which is not that long in, in legislative history, the government changed its purpose and they made it tax free. It might have been 2019 when they changed it and made it tax free. But because they made it tax free, here's my working theory. They said, well, pain and suffering payments are tax free. So we'll call it an additional pain and suffering t uh, compensation payment so that we can justify it being tax free. But again, I got news for them. If you went to court and you got an award of damages, and you got an economic award that's not taxed because it's not income, it's capital. And if you get a non-economic award like pain and suffering, you don't pay tax on that either because it's still compensation for injury and not fucking income. Remember that word from the Manoush case, income? Well, let me tell you what it is. Income is an increase in your wealth, okay? So if you didn't have any money, and then you did something and you got paid, well, you had income. But if you're walking along the road and you find a million dollars, you didn't have income because you didn't earn it, you just found it, which is luck. If you buy a ticket, win a lottery, that's chance. You can't count on chance. So that's not taxed as income. Okay? So you get hurt. You get paid damages. You're getting paid money because someone hurt you, and they're balancing the scales by paying you money, damages, to make it right. That's not taxed as income because you didn't make a profit. You have to make a profit in order to pay taxes. That's what the Income Tax Act is all about. But they're trying to call everything income, even when it's not, and they're trying to call things benefits even though it's not. I'll give you a quick example. I got $1,000, roughly, $1,017.94 from the Canada Pension Plan Disability. Now, if I wasn't getting anything else, people might look at me and say I got a benefit. Okay, but let's throw something into the mix here. Because I got $1,000 on, on my Canada Pension Plan, then I lost 1000 off my service income support insurance plan. Now, is the Canada Pension Plan Disability a benefit now? I'd say no, because at most, you broke even. Okay, but hang on now. I also lost a $1,000 off my Sun Life policy, 12500 g with the federal government. So now I got a 1000 but I lost two. No, it's not finished yet. I got a Public Service Superannuation Act pension, and they decided, because I got the Canada Pension Plan Disability, that they would use the bridging part of their act to reduce my pension by $500 a month. Now, I got a 1000 and I only had it reduced by 500 so you might say I had a benefit from the Canada Pension Plan. But it's not a 100% benefit because they took half it back. Then I had a Reserve Force Pension Plan. Now, my Reserve Force Pension Plan wasn't very much, about $300. So they decided to take $50 a month off for bridging. So altogether, I lost $2,550 a month because I got a $1,000 in Canada Pension Plan Disability. Now, in my mind, in my world, you get $2,550 taken off, so you're down $2,550, and you put a positive $1,000 with it, and you're down $1,550 fucking dollars a month. That's no benefit is I would rather do without the Canada Pension Plan Disability. But we don't get a choice. They force us to apply because they want to save money. So they use a thing called estimation. They send you a letter. They say, we think you can qualify for the Canada Pension Plan Disability. Now, if you don't apply, we're going to estimate it from your benefits anyway. So if you don't apply, you can't get approved. So they take the money off as if you're approved, but you didn't apply, you didn't get approved, so you're down that $1,000 in my case, right? But... The thing is, you shouldn't be making someone apply for something that you only have a 35 to 40% chance of getting, statistically, okay? Because the Canada Pension Plan Disability doesn't want to pay out. They want to save money for their pension plan, so they make it very difficult to get. So if you go to the doctor, you get all the paperwork filled out, you send in your application, you put a doctor's part with it, your part with it, and then they adjudicate it. In a perfect world, you think you get your pension but only 35 to 40% of the people that apply get it. 
So now how come the government and the insurance companies act as if it's an automatic right that you apply for it, you're going to get it automatically? That's going to bite them on the ass one of these days. Because if you had an automatic right to it 100%, you could probably try to justify making people apply to get it. There's a term called sitting on your rights. So it comes up usually in workers' compensation and tort lawsuits. So someone might have the right to say workers' compensation. And they didn't apply because they knew they were going to get the lawsuit damages. And I've seen cases where the judge has ruled in the favor of the, per the, the person who hurt him that you were sitting on your rights. You didn't apply for automatic benefits from your no-fault workers' compensation insurance. I'm pretty sure that I heard that shit from Manulife. And it might have been about my Canada pension plan. But that is a sad notion to think that they can try to go after someone for not doing anything. And someone else gets the benefit of their property. Because the right to get workers' compensation is because you exchange the right to sue in lawsuit, in tort, for your workers' compensation. The same as the Pension Act. So the thing is, is that has value. Now, how much value does a, a exchange of the right to sue? It has exactly the amount of whatever you get paid as comprehensive administration compensation under either Workers' Comp or the Pension Act. Whatever you get paid, that is what your right to sue was worth. It's not worth any more. It's not worth any less. But you can't sue and get money in addition to when you exchange it, right? If you are part of the workers' compensation system, people decided, deemed, that your right to sue was exchanged for the right to administrative compensation. You can't say, well, I should have got a choice because they did it for everybody. All working people in Canada usually get covered by workers' comp. And they said that nobody has the right to opt out of it, I do believe. But the thing is, <clears throat> it all comes back to the principle of compensation. That's what I was saying before. If they wanted to try to decide who got the right to file back from who, it would be a messy, messy case. Let's say that right to, right to take damages into account in a lawsuit. Workers of compensation, I mean. Well... The person at the lawsuit, they want to take the workers' compensation to account, but I bet you, if they were present, workers' compensation would say, well, you know, we want to reduce our payment because the person is going to get damages for the same event that caused him an injury on the job. So it's not you that ought to save because you hurt the person. You caused this. So in effect, it should be the workers' compensation that should save. But, you know, if the workers' compensation saved, then that would mean that they're getting a benefit at the expense of the injured worker. And that violates the merit of principles. The employer is not supposed to get a benefit saving on an expense by taking the lawsuit and tort into account. Because that's what it says in the agreement. The employer is supposed to pay 100% of the cost of the workers' compensation type insurance. If they are allowed to deduct things like pensions or damages, that means the worker paid for his own disability, which violates the rule in the merit of principles that says the employer has to pay 100%. Now, there's a caveat to that because it came up recently when my wife and I were talking about credit card companies where are supposedly they asked the government or there was a lawsuit that they can Merchants can now add a charge if the credit card company charges, then they can pass that cost on to you. And I said, that's insane. Everybody ought to know that passing on always happens anyway. So are they trying to say that they didn't take that expense into account when they priced their products that they put on the shelves? Don't fucking look at me and tell me that's true. They got to take into account things like workers' comp, electricity, employees, uh, pay. They got to take all that stuff into account and then price their products. 
the cost of any small fee from a credit card company, and I'm not backing them perks up. I'm just saying we already pay it. So I don't know where this bullshit came, and I don't really want to look it up because I'll go down a rabbit hole too much with it. But it all gets passed on to us anyway. There was a guy who did a report on the workers' compensation system in Ontario in the 1980s. Paul or Peter or someone. Begins with a T, second name. I can't remember it right now. And he said, every, well, what really happens in the case of workers' compensation is the employer either passes the cost up to the consumers or down to their employees. So when they have that expense of the workers' compensation premium, contribution, whatever you want to call it, they can add a bit to their products that they're selling, or if they don't sell a product, say they're doing a service and they only got employees, well, the next time they sit down with the employees and negotiate a deal, they hammer a harder bargain because of the workers' compensation premiums. They have that expense, so they say to the employees, well, we can't afford to pay you as much. We got this, we got that, and we got workers' compensation premiums. So, you know, here's what our offer, offer to you for your services is. So, employers save because they pass the cost of the workers' compensation to the worker who is also a consumer. That's where the passing up and the passing down it always affects the worker. Anyway, I think I've been talking long enough. It's about an hour. Hopefully I've made it a bit entertaining. Now tonight I talked a bit fast, so hopefully it's not too fast. And for most of us, well, if you're from Newfoundland, you know Newfoundlanders talk a lot uh, fast. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week.